we have come to Nintendo Power 43 for December of 1992, with a game that, thematically, might give the Super Nintendo something that might rival Sonic the Hedgehog. Does it succeed? Let's find out. Our cover for this issue is Roadrunner's Death Valley Rally. The art is, in keeping with the source material, more conventional art done the style of Chuck Jones' cartoons. The prompt for the letters column is what readers think are the best attributes for a console to have. Now, if Nintendo Power got any serious answers to that question, they didn't run them. Instead, we get a whole bunch of letters talking about how awesome the Super Nintendo is. A few of them get into things that we can translate into what they felt were virtues of a good console, like game selection, but not all of them. On the other hand, in a little sidebar, we get a little blurb hyping the upcoming CD-ROM peripheral. The blurb does not name Sony or Philips, but I did some research and kind of looked at the timeline of events, and at this time, the Sony deal had fallen through already, but, going from Wikipedia, Sony and Nintendo later tried to mend fences enough for the two companies to ink out a deal that would theoretically allow the Sony PlayStation, or the Sony Nintendo PlayStation, to go forward. If this is referring to the repaired relationship with Sony, then this shows that Nintendo was operating in good faith to promote the deal, considering that they were laying the seeds for promotion of this and announcement of this product in the future fairly early on. Now, we'll see if this gets mentioned again in the future, or if this is only going to get mentioned once and forgotten. We begin our NES coverage with Batman Returns. The Batman licenses chain developers and game genres here. We've gone from Sunsoft for the first two Batman games to Konami, and from action platformers, as with Batman and Batman Return of the Joker, to Brawlers. We have information on each of the mooks you fight, along with maps and boss strategies for the whole game. Batman Returns is almost a great brawler. Almost. The controls are good due to the limitations of the NES. They managed to design things so that they fit with what you can do with the controller and the number of buttons you have available. Further, sprites are the right size and come in small enough numbers that you can control fa crowds fairly well and without encountering a significant amount of flicker. The game also uses the license of the film in a good way, using levels that generally map well to the film's plot without excessive padding, and the events fit thematically and narratively with the film. The game even uses Ninja Gaiden-style cutscenes to bridge levels and build the game's story, something that titles like Final Fight didn't use. However, the game only gives you one life, with occasional pop-up items scattered throughout levels that sort of serve like extra lives. But otherwise, if you go down to a boss or mid-boss, you end up having to start the level over from the very beginning. That's not fun, it's, it's frustrating. The reason that brawlers kind of work is because you have multiple lives before you have to start the level over. You have an opportunity to recover if you get in a bad situation or get swarmed. Hopefully, the Super Nintendo version, and there is a Super Nintendo version, manages to avoid those these problems should it be covered in the future. Next is James Bond Jr., a NES game based on a kid's cartoon inspired by James Bond featuring his nephew. As far as the work itself goes, let's just say that while it cribbed from the films, the fact that Aeon Productions was not involved with the show aside from licensing is very telling. The game itself is one of the earliest titles we've, we've covered thus far from THQ, and the article covers the first of three levels, at least how it describes them. James Bond Jr. is interesting, as it's a title that I'd almost describe as a forgotten Metroidvania game, not the level-based game the article described as, it, as being. The game has you making your way through an evil mastermind's base, disabling his four rockets before he can launch them to destroy the world, and you have 50 minutes in real time to do it. It's rather impressive, though the game's execution is lacking in a few ways. When you fall into hazards like toxic chemicals or water, you bounce around almost uncontrollably, taking damage with each bounce until you get out of the hazard, as opposed to just constantly taking damage as in Metroid until you can jump out. With, in turn, Metroid giving you the ability to upgrade your armor so you can navigate these hazards with less of an issue. Additionally, the game has falling damage, which is something that Metroid and even Castlevania don't have. It makes the game much more frustrating than it really needs to be, especially since the game puts some 
unavoidable massive drops very early on in the game. The game feels also kind of like a European developed PC platformer with the kind of floaty jump physics that you get from those type of games. The controls are also kind of awkward. In order to change weapons you have to press down and select, which if select was used for other things would make sense, but it's not. The select button doesn't do anything on its own. There is a Super Nintendo James Bond Jr. game which I may get to cover later. If it stays in the same style of game with improved animations and controls, and maybe some additional innovations to make navigating the levels a little easier, it might actually make for a hidden gem in the Super Nintendo game library. By comparison though, this game, James Bond Jr. for the NES, is a diamond in the rough. It is something with potential, but in need of more polish and refinement, but unfortunately it's polish and refinement that the game never got prior to release. Next up is Tecmo NBA Basketball, with Tecmo taking on another major U.S. sport on the NES. The title gives notes on the different types of plays and general tips on playing basketball. I have never been a fan of basketball games on the NES. Not before, not now. I do appreciate the game has not only the NBA license, but it has what appears to be all the NBA teams, including the Portland Trailblazers, that was a team that occasionally got dropped from licensed games around this time. Which is a shame because this was this lineup of the Blazers is one of the best lineups they've ever had in their history. On the one hand, the game handles passing really well and really intuitively. You just tap a button and it goes to a selected player. On the other hand, shots are not based on player skill or char or an amalgam of skill and plus character stats but on a dice roll based on the character stats, one behind the scenes, it's a little rough when it comes to judging who you should be taking a shot with. With a situation where, for example, you use a combination of the two, a where the shot is based on character skill, but modified by the player stats, so a player who's really good with three-point shots would be more likely to make a shot, three-point shot from wherever, but you as a player have some influence on when you like release the ball during the jump shot or whatever, I'd appreciate that and make things more interesting and more fun. But as it's executed here, it doesn't quite work. It's interesting, but it's not my thing. And I'll say if you collect sports games, you should definitely pick this up. It's a great little capsule shot of an era of the NBA, and it's done in the Tecmo sports game style with little cutscene animatics for big plays like with Tecmo Bowl and Tecmo Super Bowl, except here with since basketball with slam dunks and that sort of thing. Next is Caesar's Palace, a collection of gambling games with slots, video poker, blackjack, big six, and roulette used in the game. Or in other words, these are all games that do not require coding an AI, just random number generators and a nice looking interface that emulates a casino environment, so I'm going to skip this game because you can still find these for super cheap at Office Depot. Maybe without the Caesar's Palace license, but you could probably find it with the Caesar's Palace license. In classified information, we have a neat trick to show the difficulty of the current stage or section of a stage in Space Megaforce, along with a way to rack up the one-ups in Super Star Wars. In the Legend of Zelda comic, Link and Ganon square off. With Zelda's help, with, due to firing the killing blow with the bow, they are able to slay Ganon and save both worlds. However, on returning to Hyrule, Link is made guardian of the Triforce, which keeps him from Zelda once again, ending the story on something of a melancholic note. Moving into Game Boy titles, we're continuing the coverage of Super Mario Land 2, which I've already reviewed, so we'll not be reviewing it again here. This article gives notes on each of the worlds in the game. Next up is Bonk's Adventure, which is a notable title for several reasons. First, we have the mascot for the PC Engine showing up on the Game Boy. And very much the mascot. The Japanese title for the Bonk's games was PC Genjin. So, mm. a pun off the name of the system itself. So, Bonk's presence on the Game Boy says something significant about the health of the PC Engine TurboGrafx ecosystem. Second, the title in question is being featured in Nintendo Power. I'm not sure if this is the equivalent of Nintendo doing the mocking jig, or if this is due to the strength of the game. 
There is only one way to find out. Oh, the article itself. It gives maps and notes for each level of the game. Bonk's Adventure is a little like Castlevania. Not in terms of tone or themes, but in the sense that it is a very deliberate platformer. As with Castlevania, your main attack isn't something you can necessarily spam. It is a commitment. And by your main attack, I mean your diving headbutt. You have a regular standing headbutt that you can do, but if you want to be effective, you have to do the diving headbutt, which requires jumping and then hitting the attack button in midair to go down in an arc. And when you hit that button determines when your arc is, and you can hit this again on the rebound as well, because you bounce back up after you land the attack. Consequently, the deliberateness of this attack, attack makes for the thing that makes Bonk's adventure so unique as far as mascot platformers are concerned. You have to pay attention to your environment, you have to pay attention to your enemies, and you have to learn their strengths, weaknesses, and animations to determine how to handle these headbutt attacks. So, whether you're attacking them from the ground, jumping up, as with birds, because that counts for a headbutt, or whether you're ending up having to hit enemies multiple times, so you have to make sure you hit the attack button again on the rebound, or various other factors as well. It all makes for a very interesting title, and it makes me wish I knew about the Bonk game sooner, because this is surprisingly fun, and I wish I'd kind of gotten into this earlier. Now, before we get into Roadrunner's dedicated game on the Super Nintendo, we have a Looney Tunes game for the Game Boy. Each of the main protagonist Looney Tunes gets a single level, with them in the limelight, with in turn each level having them take on one of their recurring antagonists, more or less. We get in order Daffy Duck, Tweety Bird, Porky Pig, the Tasmanian Devil, Speedy Gonzalez, the Roadrunner, and finally Bugs Bunny. Looney Tunes is somewhat interesting as a platformer due to the concept of giving each level, because of the change of characters, a different playstyle, with the levels designed in a way where they train the player how each character plays in a fairly decent fashion. However, it's not without its issues. For example, the game shoves a rotter level into the title very early, and while the physics and sprite dimensions work great for standard platformer gameplay, there isn't enough room on screen for a proper water level. The water levels that work, like for example in Super Mario Bros. 1, give you enough real estate where you as the player have room to maneuver, and plan ahead and look around your environments. Here though, the water levels are just too claustrophobic. It's a clear case here of, once again, developers feeling out how platformers should work on the Game Boy, and discovering an issue that they hadn't anticipated, perhaps a little too late. Another comic is concluding this issue with Super Mario Adventures wrapping. Mario crashes the lightning, and Luigi and the Yoshis cr crush Bowser's army. The day is saved. The end. Also, Luigi and the Yoshis is the name of my Rockabilly Koji Kondo cover band. In Counselor's Corner, we have questions for Link to the Past and Street Fighter 2, along with some additional questions about Dragon Quest 3. Moving into Super Nintendo titles, we have Desert Strike from EA. We have a rundown of your possible co-pilots and a map of the first level. Going from the article, the game looks kind of like an isometric choplifter. Well, the choplifter comparison is actually fairly correct. Sort of. As you make your way through the game's levels, you take on various objectives over a large, very expansive map. I'm, I'm talking really expansive. It took me about half an hour to beat the first level of the game. That was using some stave scumming, so I didn't have to keep starting over when I died. In addition to taking out selected targets, you also have to neutralize any defenses and rescue captured soldiers, which is where the choplifter comparison comes in, because most levels usually have a drop point that you take the captured soldiers to, and you usually also have some fuel and ammunition restocks as well, in addition to all their stocks that you find across the map. Once level is completed, you are graded based on the primary and secondary objectives in the mission. Narratively, the game's story is basically a 90s-esque vehicle action film story like the Iron Eagle films, with you going to not Iraq to take on not Saddam, who is called in the game only the Madman. It's not a particularly involved narrative, but the cutscenes are nicely done with some digitized characters. It's nowhere near Ninja Gaiden grade cutscenes, but I do appreciate the effort, and the digitized sprites look pretty good on the um, 
Super Nintendo. We now come to our cover game, Roadrunner's Death Valley Rally. Judging from the article, this looks like a very speedy platformer using the Looney Tunes license to put you as the Roadrunner fleeing the attacks of Wily e. Coyote. We even have maps of the first level for the first few worlds. Some of these stages look incredibly complex, though. Man, I wish this game was so much better. Conceptually, it's structured perfectly. You play as the Roadrunner, running at great speed with a really strong, intensive intense sense of speed through a series of levels structured as various Roadrunner cartoons, with each act of the level having the Coyote attempting a different harebrained scheme to take out the Roadrunner, with throwing explosive wind-up airplanes from a balloon to the classic quote-unquote Batman suit from one of the Wily e. Coyote um, cartoons itself. I believe all of their attacks are taken in some form or another from an actual Wily e. Coyote cartoon. And each act, even, um, starts off with the classic Wily e. Coyote and Roadrunner opening with the two running along and then the tongue-in-cheek, fake Latin, si faux scientific names for each of the two of them popping up on screen. However, as the acts go on, the game's focus goes less from platforming, from running fast, to platforming, and precise platforming for that matter. This is an issue because while the game requires precise platforming to progress, the game's actual platforming is the opposite of precise. On numerous occasions, I found myself clipping through platforms and having to save scum jumps in order until I figured out the right way to take each series of jumps in order to make sure that I stuck the landing. This is a bummer, because this is the kind of game that I think would go great at something like Games Done Quick. It's a game that you can play quickly, but gives you some nice bits of spectacle that makes it enjoyable to show in front of an audience and gives you an opportunity to read the various donations during these bits of spectacle. This concept of taking a whole bunch of Looney Tunes cartoons focused on one primary protagonist character and stringing them together in a video game concept is something that we will revisit in a, in a later issue, of having looked ahead at cover games, and hopefully in a form that will work better. LJN has another Marvel licensed game in Spider-Man and the X-Men in Arcade's Revenge. This time they're actually making more use of the background of the license as if you want to do a variety of stage themes for your video game, Arcade's a great villain to do that with, and Spider-Man and the X-Men are Arcade's most frequent foes. The article has uh, maps and notes for the stages for Spider-Man, Wolverine, Storm, Cyclops, and Gambit. This is an unfortunately tedious game. There is such a thing as too much non-linearity if the non-linearity is executed poorly. Each level is somewhat mage-like, with the various X-Men and Spider-Man having to use their abilities to traverse levels and overcome enemies. The problem is that the game's levels can be rather obnoxious to traverse, with some enemies requiring some very finicky platforming to defeat. Also, some of the traversal, particularly with Spider-Man, calls for some extra precise platforming even more than some of the other characters have, which is particularly an issue when it comes to some of the more claustrophobic elements of the stages, especially Spider-Man stages, which have you web-slinging around spikes. On the one hand, this is probably the best LJN-licensed game we've covered thus far, but that's damning with faint praise, as it's still a very flawed game. Still, it feels like LGN is finding their footing on the Super Nintendo in a way that they never quite had on the NES. Next up, from another publisher who has had a checkered past, we have Pushover, a puzzle game which appears to mix both Lemmings and the whole Domino Rally phenomenon from the 90s. There are notes on several levels in the game. This game is addictive as freaking hell is all the deliberation and planning of Lemmings, but it plays so much faster, and the feedback you get is almost immediate. If you screw up, you knew why you screwed up immediately, and you know right away what exactly you did and how you could fix it. 
This game is a blast to play, and it's probably the best title we've gotten from Ocean thus far. Finally, on the Super Nintendo front, we have Super Scope 6, with notes on three of the games in the collection. Now, I'm going to skip this game. As with Zapper titles, I've used a Zapper before, so I know how it controls and how it handles, so I can appro approach playing the game in an emulator for purposes of video capture in the context of that knowledge. I don't have that for the Super Scope, because the Super Scope, unlike the Gun Con, unlike the Zapper, unlike the uh, gun from Lethal Enforcers, has the bazooka thing, so there's an entirely different ergonomic situation with it, and there's the whole question of whether or not the scope part actually is accurate enough to aim with. So, I'm recording this prior to Portland Retro Gaming Expo in October, and I want to see, at the convention, if I'm going to get, if I can get hands-on time with the Super Scope, because they have Super Nintendos and CRTs there. And if I can get hands-on time with the Super Scope, get an idea how it works, how it aims, how it fits, and that sort of thing, then I'm going to see if I can revisit Super Scope games in a special episode with that hands-on experience, so I have a better understanding, okay, how well will this game theoretically have actually played? In Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is playing Super Star Wars, and we get the advice to spin in circles and Luke Speeder to score some points and get some breathing room. In the top 20... Street Fighter 2 remains on top of the Super Nintendo charts, with Mario holding on to the other two systems. The Celeb Profile article is back, with an interview with Craig T. Nelson, who at this time is best known for his role in Coach. Now, he is best known for playing Bob Parr, a.k.a. Mr. Incredible, in The Incredibles, which is getting a sequel real soon now, along with the main role on the sitcom Parenthood. In the Now Playing column, Among the Lost... The also rans is the strategy game Gemfire, and the Super Nintendo version of Prince of Persia, which is probably the best version of that game. It's certainly the version that was used on Game Center CX. In the Packwatch column, we have a glimpse of Sonic Blast Man and Yoshi's Cookie. In the Japan Watch section, Tokyo Game Show has come and gone, so we're not focusing on an individual title here. Instead, looking at a variety of titles, including Final Fantasy V, which we never got in the U.S., at least not in the Super Nintendo, we got it after the fact, and Barcode Battler, which we also didn't get in the U.S. My pick of the episode, much to my own surprise, is Pushover. Pushover is a really fun, really engaging puzzle title, and not at all what I was expecting from a PC port from Ocean, who thus far has never failed to disappoint. It's like... It feels like the next evolution of Lemmings. I'm surprised we didn't get more games which sort of emulated this. It, it takes the Lemmings formula, and it modifies it perfectly in ways that the other games that try to do the same thing, like, for example, the uh, Carsey's Funhouse game failed at. I definitely recommend checking Pushover out. <laughs> Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everyone. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.